Chapter 2, Little Man March 1997 It was a day of small miracles, starting with his unexpected spring from the pinta to the first glimpse of his baby boy's picture and the warm embraces of family. So many things converged to tell Sal the universe at last wanted to give him a break, that the loyalty he'd always shown to his homeboys would not go unrewarded. He sat in the front of Lobo's new Corolla, cruising with his two closest friends. Lobo had hauled his ass out of bed to show Sal Castaneda a proper welcome home, and Bird took the back seat in honor of his friend's return. This was the love and respect of men who had each other's back, a soul deep bond only a soldier could understand. How many times had these carnales risked their lives for Sal, and he'd done the same for them? They'd all put their lives on the line for the cause. For the first time in years, it seemed as if Sal had a future. When the sun rose in a few hours, he'd ride across town to see his newborn son. Would hold him and feel the swell of hope. Every child brings a loving parent. Then he'd know a new kind of freedom. He would step away from the West La Familia. His homies had to understand. He put in a decade of work and it was time to step back. They couldn't deny he'd held it down for the cause more than most. In the morning, life would start over. The Corolla pulled onto the freeway, gaining speed as the lights of Salinas faded. Then the coldness of metal delicately brushed the back of Sal's head, suspending his dreams like leaves that never fell to the earth. Hours earlier at San Quentin's gate, no one had waited to greet Sal with kisses and a set of dress-out clothes. His girl wasn't there, and the homeboys weren't either. They had all heard he caught an extra six months for hiding a sharpened toothbrush handle while in the hole. But somehow, the new charge got lost in the paperwork, and by seven, on that cool March evening in 1997, Sal unexpectedly found himself a free man. The Department of Corrections gave him a ride over the Golden Gate, where no doubts thousands before him had turned to wave goodbye to the medieval dungeon walls of San Quentin. For Sal, any glance backward would have deeper resonance because he was leaving his father behind. Yes, Salvador Sr. was also within those confines. And what was so strange about that? Yes, Salvador Sr. was also within those confines. And what was so strange about that? That's how it was when you grew up in a place like Salinas, where loving beyond the law was so often a family affair. Sal boarded a Greyhound in San Francisco, still wearing tan scrubs and slip-on prison sneakers, a pack of cigarettes in his front shirt pocket, and the rest of his worldly goods in a brown paper sack. Sal was a man on the edge, balancing the finest line a human could walk. He was a full-on familiano who had taken the blood-in, blood-out oath of the game. According to the Constitution, he had vowed to uphold the only way to leave Nuestra Familia was by death. Yet now, for the first time since he swore to the 14 bonds and then put in the work to become a carna, he wavered. Family tugged at him. His real family, not the prison gang generals who promised to replace the love of kin in exchange for his soul. The truth was, Nuestra Familia had ripped his family asunder. The gang wanted his brother dead. His father was still in the pinta, his little brother behind the walls in Soledad, and his brand new son was born while he was locked up a hundred miles from home. A tiny baby whose face he had yet to see, the child had come into the world bearing his name. Could this unexpected spring from the pinta be a sign that family mattered more than any old? His grandmother, his creída, abuelita, yeah I know man, my Spanish is fucked up, it's all good, would soon embrace him, welcome him into her home and always open heart. She was the last person clinging to the belief that Sal could still become the kind of man who'd hold down the job and do right by his family in ways his father never could. The sky darkened over the foothills south of San Francisco as urban landscape gave way to twinkling suburbs and finally the flat, dark fields that marked the northern tip of the Salinas Valley, that long, leaf-shaped swath of fecking black earth and unforgiving winds. Then came the dim lights of Old Town and the smudge stained glass sign on Cap Saloon across from the Greyhound Station. Nothing had changed in Salinas. As much as his life held promise, 
The town was a reminder that Sal was not a free man. Free from prison, yes, but not from his gang. How could he leave La Familia? What man had ever managed to get out and to live to tell about it? Maybe he would not quit exactly, but just step away, ease on out. If anyone could pull it off, it'd be Sal, with his gift for negotiation. Hadn't his eloquent words once spared his little brother's life? It was late when he stopped into the Galabon Street, almost 11 p.m., so he didn't hurry to his grandma's house. He didn't go see his girlfriend, though she lived a block and a half away from the bus station and just four weeks earlier had given birth to his son. He couldn't face her yet. She didn't approve of his lifestyle. They fought and he'd gotten into a physical fight with her again. It was a stupid mistake, one that sent him back to prison. She didn't write the whole six months he was locked up and he never called, and she'd named the baby after him. He hadn't eaten for hours, but he didn't hit the convenience stores on Main Street or stop for a drink at Caps. It was close to midnight now, the air crisp and clear. The night was quiet in those few hours before the semis began their pre-dawn rumblings, warming for the trek to bring America its spring produce. The young woman was asleep, but the loud knock woke her. After the shock of seeing her cousin Sal, she thought he'd be locked up till fall. Irene, of course, let him in. He was family. Rico's old lady, Regina, joined them in the kitchen. Rico was in jail again, but Sal was always welcome here. Regina was good people with a reputation for opening her door to familianos no matter what hour. She and Sal grew up together and were so close she considered herself as much as a cousin as Irene. It was no secret that Sal craved any sort of kin. He'd been raised by an aunt he called his mother and with his father locked up, he became the guardian angel who watched out for his younger brother Pablo. The brothers could almost be mistaken for twins. Both had compact bodies, cinnamon skins, and profiles that might have been lifted off a Mayan carving. Yet, they couldn't have been more different. Sal was disciplined, old school, loyal, whereas Pablo had a wild mouth and was reckless. Over the years, Sal let himself be embraced by a powerful surrogate family, the NF, and that family did not appreciate Pablo the way he did. Yet, they stayed close, with Sal pulling Pablo out of more than one mess, defending him the way an older brother ought to, without judgment or hesitation. Both had been Samsters since they were kids, representing the Northeño cause for Salinas East Market almost from the days of the fruit stand wars. Unlike Pablo, Sal put in plenty of work and made it all the way from East Marqueta to the top of Salinas' crew with Rico and Lobo. Sal had Sam tattoos on his arm and leg and for extra protection, one of the Virgin de Guadalupe. He had Vida Loca across his fingers of his left hand and he had earned a pair of teardrop tats at the corner of his left eye. Sal had built plenty of creds. Most recently, he was the Cardinal who passed the razor when they sliced that no good in the courthouse holding cell. Lately though, Sal had committed the treasonous act of growing closer to his real family than La Familia. Dangerous though it was, the subtle shift in loyalty was understandable as he entered his 30s. For a gangster, he was practically a senior citizen. And who'd been there for him during the hard times? There's a Mexican saying that only in prison or a hospital do you learn who is truly your friend. His grandmother wrote him twice while he was in Quinton. Sal wrote back telling his abuelita he looked forward to being home and getting a job at a moving company. She'd normally be one of his first stops when he got out of lockup. And if the hour wasn't so late, she might have been this time too. She'd have been thrilled by the surprise. Irene and Regina saw that Sal was in good spirits, all laughing and joking and happy, of course, about being let out early from the pinta. Regina noticed he wore a gold band on his finger, which she thought was strange since he hadn't married his girlfriend. She asked about it, and Sal told Regina he wouldn't marry her until he was off parole, which sounded as if he were dreaming of a future. Regina wondered if there was a new woman in his life. He only told them he wasn't sure about getting back with this girl. Then Irene pulled out a picture of Sal's newborn baby. As Sal stared at the face of his boy, the son he'd never met, Irene thought, he looks happy. 
They kept up the good natured conversation for an hour or so until Sal stood and went into another room to use the phone. Sal relaxed when he sat back down with his primas. He joked and chatted, then asked if it was okay to leave his brown paper sack with them. He promised his cousins he'd be back for breakfast and he'd pick up the sack then. Irene said he never told them where he was going or who he was seeing, and they didn't ask. Under a waning sliver of a moon, Sal stepped into the chilling air. There were lots of reasons the NF wanted Sal dead. The worst defense was that he defended his brother in the jail. Lobel described Sal's act of treason as choosing his family over the organization. Another story around town said Sal had refused to kill an anti-gang counselor. In several cities, the NF was on a crusade against those do-gooder types. In one instance, claiming a guy was poisoning young minds by steering kids away from gangs. Others said Lobel feared Sal planned to take over his crew. It was probably all those reasons plus a few that would never be known. Lobel liked to go to bed early and it was late, maybe past midnight when Rico's old lady called to say Sal had unexpectedly showed up at her pad. She calls me and tells me my buddy was out, Lobel recalled later. Her words were confusing at first but he figured out Regina was referring to Little Man. That was his homeboy's moniker for Sal. Lobo was reluctant to drag his hefty self out of bed, and hefty he was. Everything about the man emanated largeness. The word Salas was tattooed in gigantic colonial letters across his round belly, and a thick black norte covered half his back. His neck was as wide as his face. He had a bowling ball of a head, tiny eyes that were swallowed by cheeks, and a wide froggy mouth. <laughs> Lobo knew there was no chance of going back to sleep. He had to get his ass up and deal with this. He and Rico and the rest of the regiment had just met to discuss the latest green light from Pelican Bay. It was in order to kill Little Man. There was not much discussion though. The meeting was just basically putting the groundwork on the orders to hit him, as Lobo put it. Being the man in charge of Salinas at the moment, with the crew boss, Mikeo, in prison and Rico in jail for a quick stint, Lobo phoned his homeboy Bird, whom he liked to call Big Bird because the guy was lanky and real long. Lobo and Big Bird drove to the arsenal, a house where the NF stashed its weapons. No one who lived there was on parole, so the arsenal was never vulnerable to random searches by the cops gang unit. They chose a small caliber semi-automatic. With weapons secured, Lobo phoned Regina and said, hey, where's homeboy? She put Sal on the line and Lobo told him, we're going over there right now. Oh, Sal replied as if surprised by this offer. All right. As Lobo drove to get Sal, he choreographed the hit with Big Bird. It was agreed that Lobo would do the shooting. Big Bird would hold the gun until they arrived. In the dark, Bird would pass the cuete to Lobo who'd knock on Regina's door pull out little man and march behind him toward the car. He'd whack him right there and leave the body where it fell. Bird would only keep the engine running so they could split fast. To their surprise though, Sal was outside waiting for them. They had to execute a swift change of plans. Bird got out and took the back seat as if showing respect to a brother who had just come home from prison. Sal slid in the front. They hit the 101, racing north past the malls past the last road out of Salinas until the city lights became scattered flickers along a remote horizon and only wide. Cool fields light ahead, dampening the nighttime dew.